So we established this campaign around 2006 and formally launched it in 2007. Um, and back then we, I guess, had a bold plan to establish a global movement against nuclear weapons. We were concerned that the anti-nuclear movement was languishing and needed to be re-energised and we felt that the specific objective needed to be a treaty that outlawed nuclear weapons completely. Um, there were already treaties banning chemical and biological weapons as well as landmines. Uh, there was a process underway at that stage for the ban on cluster munitions and we thought why not uh, a ban on nuclear weapons. These are the worst of all weapons. Surely they should be subject to a, a total prohibition. Um, and the fact that we were uh, in Australia at the bottom of the world certainly didn't uh, uh, stop us from taking on this task of uh, building this, this global network. And uh, everyone who we approached around the world uh, really embraced the idea and, and very quickly we built uh, a coalition of a few hundred organisations. Uh, the idea of a, of a global ban on nuclear weapons really did resonate. Um, and it was a, an exciting time for me. I was a university student and I was studying international law. And the idea of being kind of part of a, a movement that would create new international law to address one of the uh, biggest challenges that we face as humanity um, was really quite thrilling um, and it was the first time that I had visited the United Nations uh, back in 2007 when we had the one of the uh, official launches of the campaign um, and kind of seeing um, the governments in the room and realizing that they weren't really doing what they needed to do uh, was a wake-up call for me and it kind of demonstrated the importance of, of this global civil society movement. Uh, we couldn't just leave it to governments alone to do the right thing. And I remember being told by one of the ambassadors whom we met um, that nothing will ever change unless there's another nuclear attack. Basically we needed to see the incineration of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people before uh, governments would finally kind of muster the political will to address this problem of nuclear weapons. And um, to me that was just so horrifying and, and upsetting uh, and it really kind of made me determined uh, to succeed um, and I think that there were so many people um, who shared that objective of, of really changing the diplomatic debate and also uh, raising pu global public awareness of the threat that we face. From the beginning we wanted to engage organisations that weren't necessarily involved in nuclear disarmament work already but which were involved in work that was direct or in some way related to what we were trying to achieve and so we reached out to trade unions, we reached out to churches, we reached out to environment groups, humanitarian groups and said this is an issue that will profoundly affect uh, the work that you're doing um, that we if we all work together can really make uh, meaningful progress towards a nuclear weapon free world uh, and the only way we're going to achieve elimination is by kind of building a global movement and we can't deal with the consequences of a nuclear war our only option is to prevent that and so we um, of course you know, wrote to organizations um, and you know, uh, uh, and made use of existing networks but we also traveled around the world and informed people about this new campaign that we were launching and uh, asked them to, to be involved uh, and um, worked out ways that they could um, contribute to this global effort. Um, we 
spoke at the United Nations, we spoke in national parliaments, we spoke to the media, uh, we briefed journalists, we uh, did everything that we could to uh, publicise the fact that ICANN existed and um, a ban on nuclear weapons was an idea whose time had come. I think one of the common criticisms of the anti-nuclear movement is that it's uh, primarily old people and uh, we certainly didn't want to create a campaign which would just be um, of a particular generation and so we worked uh, hard to engage many uh, high school students, university students and I think one of the strengths of ICANN is that we do have people of all generations involved uh, and yeah, we have 90 year olds working very well alongside uh, people in their teens and uh, and I think we've always tried to include all of those voices we don't uh, uh, treat anyone's opinion as more worthy than uh, anyone else's because I think we all bring to this campaign our own experiences and perspectives which uh, have been essential to the success of what we've done so far. Um, so in the 1950s and 1960s uh, nuclear weapons were tested in Australia by the British government with the full support of the Australian government uh, and this has had a profound impact particularly on the indigenous communities that live nearby. Um, we've also had testing in our neighbourhood in the Pacific Islands, particularly uh, the Marshall Islands and what is now Kiribati and French Polynesia. This was testing by the US government, by the French government and by the British government uh, with very little concern for the health and welfare of the Pacific Islanders. And even though the test stopped more than two decades ago, the consequences are still being felt today and uh, the voices of those who have suffered as a result of nuclear testing both in Australia and the Pacific uh, have been so important in uh, demonstrating why we need this total ban on nuclear weapons uh, and really uh, heightening global public awareness of the catastrophic consequences um, of their use. Uh, and of course the effects uh, are felt over generations uh, and over wide areas because of the dispersal of radiation. Uh, and this new treaty, the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty, uh, not only prohibits the wartime use of nuclear weapons, but also prohibits nuclear testing. And we hope that uh, we'll never see uh, a nuclear weapon tested again. So the adoption of the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty in 2017 was such a huge breakthrough uh, for the international community, for global civil society. Uh, the United Nations had been working to address the threat of nuclear weapons since its foundation. Um, the very first resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly was for the total elimination of all weapons adaptable to mass destruction. Um, and yet it took all that time to finally put in place a, a total ban on the weapons. Uh, and it of course does not yet have universal support, but it does have the support of around two-thirds of the international community and I think we're going to see that support uh, grow over time as more and more countries accept that there can be no legitimate role whatsoever for these uh, truly horrific weapons. The treaty uh, includes a broad range of prohibitions, uh, a prohibition of course on the use uh, of nuclear weapons as well as the threatened use of nuclear weapons, uh, a prohibition on testing and production of nuclear weapons uh, and indeed a prohibition on the possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, it also says that a country cannot assist another country to engage in any of these kinds of activities and this is a really important element of the treaty because uh, while we have only nine nuclear armed countries we have a few dozen more countries that are very much part of this global problem because they're in some way uh, encouraging the possession of nuclear weapons or assisting uh, 
another state to prepare for the potential use of nuclear weapons. And this treaty says that that behaviour too is absolutely unacceptable. Um, so I think that when we can bring some of those countries on board with this treaty, uh, when we can uh, bring some of the nuclear armed states on board, uh, we're going to see a very radical shift um, and rapid movement towards uh, total nuclear disarmament. Uh, the treaty also uh, includes provisions for uh, assisting victims of the use of nuclear weapons and the testing of nuclear weapons. Um, and this uh, is modelled on similar provisions in the treaties that ban landmines and cluster munitions. Uh, and there's a provision for the remediation of environments that have been contaminated from nuclear testing. Uh, so I think that this, uh, even in the short term, can have uh, a really significant uh, impact on the lives of ordinary people uh, in areas that have suffered uh, from these terrible weapons. Uh, and the treaty will enter into force once 50 countries have signed and ratified it. So we hope that this treaty will enter into force in 2019 or 2020. Uh, we've made good progress already towards achieving the entry into force. Uh, and we know that many countries uh, are well underway with their ratification processes. Uh, and in fact, the pace of ratification uh, has been generally faster than that, um, than the pace for other treaties related to weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so we're quite encouraged by the, the progress so far. Um, and we know that uh, for the overwhelming majority of the world's countries, this is a very simple question. Um, of course, they support the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Of course, they uh, believe that these weapons should never be used again. Uh, and so signing and ratifying the treaty is uh, such an obvious choice from a humanitarian perspective, from an international law perspective. Um, they just want nothing whatsoever to do um, with nuclear weapons. Uh, I think that this is one of the most important achievements of the United Nations and we might not recognise that now um, or when the treaty was adopted, um, many media outlets around the world ignored it, uh, but I think in years to come we will look back on this as uh, a milestone in uh, the history of the UN and indeed um, the history of humanity when we said uh, no these weapons are not acceptable and need to be totally uh, eliminated uh, and we've had this kind of mindset ever since the the cold war that uh, the weapons somehow bring security for certain countries and they're creating stability and so on well there's not much stability in the world today and uh, there's a risk at any moment that these weapons will be used again, whether deliberately or by accident. Uh, and I think that more and more countries are coming to, to realise that and we're seeing, as a result of this treaty, a fundamental shift in the discourse. Uh, and you know, no one's saying that chemical or biological weapons are okay for certain countries but not others and and no one's saying that uh, it's okay to be sheltering under a chemical weapon umbrella or a biological weapon umbrella uh, and yet the kind of attitude towards nuclear weapons has been um, been different and and we're I think we will move to a point where the taboo against nuclear weapons um, is as strong as the taboo against other weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I think that this treaty will have very practical uh, impacts even in the short term. Uh, we have already seen a number of financial institutions around the world uh, divest from companies that produce nuclear weapons and they've done that because nuclear weapons are now illegal under international law. Uh, and previously they would exclude other types of controversial weapons and yet not the most destructive weapons of all and they've realised that that was an error and so they're correcting that error 
and millions, potentially billions of dollars are being uh, taken away from the nuclear weapon producing companies. Uh, this is a huge blow to their business uh, and will make it harder and harder for nuclear armed states to continue modernizing their nuclear arsenals. And the harder that that is, the more that they will consider disarmament as a real option. Um, I also think that countries like the United States have relied so much on the support of their allies in, uh, in terms of maintaining their nuclear war fighting capacity. And if that support cease to exist, uh, the United States will become much more serious about disarmament. Uh, and if they're serious about disarmament, uh, I think we will see Russia change its attitude. Uh, we'll see other NATO countries uh, like uh, the United Kingdom and France change their positions. Um, they will also then be pushing India and Pakistan and others to join. Um, so you can see how these small changes now could have uh, a huge effect over time. We never said that this treaty would eliminate nuclear weapons overnight. Uh, we know that there is um, you know, a path, a long path ahead of us, that there are huge challenges in getting to zero nuclear weapons, but we would not have been able to get there uh, without a total prohibition. Uh, without a treaty uh, that clearly states that these weapons are, are illegitimate for all countries. That is the essential foundation for a nuclear weapon free world. That's what's going to get us on the path uh, to that goal. This has been such a rewarding campaign to be part of. Uh, to have the opportunity to work with such talented and passionate people, uh, to uh, be part of a historic process that will have uh, implications for the security and welfare of future generations um, is a great privilege and honour. Um, and I just feel so lucky to be part of ICANN, to um, have been able to work with this, uh, this amazing team. Uh, and uh, every day I feel as if we're, we're making a a little bit of progress uh, towards our ultimate goal of, of eliminating nuclear weapons. Um, and it's those small um, achievements that are what uh, keep me motivated. And uh, we have uh, a very concrete task, and that is to get the treaty entered into force um, and uh, ultimately get every country in the world uh, to join it. And so each new signature and ratification of this treaty is um, a step towards that goal. And that makes the, this task of eliminating nuclear weapons feel more achievable and tangible. Um, and I couldn't think of anything else that I would prefer to be doing.